I am Reverend Susan Hendershot, and I'm the president of Interfaith Power and Light. Interfaith Power and Light was founded 20 years ago as a religious response to global warming, and our mission is to inspire and mobilize people of faith and conscience to take bold and just action on climate change. So the way that my spiritual and moral philosophy um, informs my work um, is primarily, I would say, through the lens of justice. Um, in my early career, I was uh, serving local congregations um, in my faith tradition, which is the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, which is a Protestant denomination. And um, I was very concerned about justice related issues such as hunger, um, uh, global water shortages and conflict, um, and especially looking at the implications in the communities in which I was working, so at the very um, local level. And um, you know, I think back to even the time when I decided to attend seminary and my thinking at the time when I was uh, looking at attending seminary was not that I was going to serve in the local um, church context, um, but actually taking a more global justice view to um, sort of righting the wrongs that, that I was seeing um, that existed out in the world and a lot of the inequities that existed in the world. Um, so, I feel like my faith has informed that, um, particularly through the scriptures as I interpret um, the Judeo-Christian scriptures, um, the words of the prophets in particular, um, and looking at sort of how is the world now? What's the realistic view of what, the wor what is happening in the world? Um, and then what is my response from a place of justice? And so that really has been the focus of my calling throughout my career. Um, I feel like um, sort of the, the you know, we're in a really interesting place and time right now. Um, you know, we are in the midst of a global pandemic, of course. We are, uh, have been for some time in the midst of a climate crisis, of course. Um, and in the United States in particular, we are in the midst of this uh, period of racial reckoning that has been really a long time coming. And of course, uh, as I consider the things that are happening in our world today, I see all of this as really interconnected with one another. Um, when we go back to the roots of our history in the US, um, to the roots of slavery and colonialism, um, you know, just the, the really deep injustices that have been in place for a long time and the structures of oppression that have been in place for a long time, um, what we see is that all of that is completely interconnected with those who are suffering the most from pollution, uh, with those who have been suffering the most from uh, COVID-19, and, um, and, and then just the, the structures of oppression that have kept um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color um, really marginalized in this country for um, far too long. And as I think about it, I think that there is a huge opportunity here. Um, as we think about the interconnection of these injustices, we can also think about the fact that the solutions um, also need to be intersectional. And so there are some real efforts taking place to bring those approaches together, to have conversations that center justice um, in health, in environmental justice, um, in racial justice, and to um, not continue to silo the issues um, in ways that I think have sort of kept us a little bit complacent and a little too comfortable for a long time. And so I think now is a time for us to experience some real discomfort, um, but also look for what the opportunities are for us to move forward in ways that are much more equitable um, and will center justice in all of those pieces of work. As I think about some of the concrete steps that we need to put into place, um, I think in particular about um, 
an intersectional approach and what I would refer to as a systems approach to the work. And so, for example, at Interfaith Power and Light, um, we are, you know, sort of working three primary levers in our work right now. Um, the first of those is about personal action. We really want to teach people how to lower their energy use in their homes and in their places of worship as an act of faith. We want faith leaders to be uh, preaching and teaching on issues connected to climate justice. Um, and we are providing resources for them to do that. Um, but we know that we can't stop there, that it isn't just about personal action and that's not going to get us where we need to be. So the second lever is around advocacy. And we have affiliates in 40 states around the country, which gives us the ability to work uh, on policy advocacy at the local, the state, and the federal level. And we know that it's the combination of those things. You know, sometimes there's there's greater opportunity at the local level than there is at the state or the federal level. Sometimes it's at the state level. Right now it's a little challenging at the federal level. Um, but we are working, you know, all of those levers of advocacy. Um, but then that also isn't quite enough, right? And so the third lever that we are um, working is the lever of voter mobilization. Um, we believe right now that we uh, need to be speaking to candidates. Um, we need to be voting with creation and climate in mind. And we need to be turning out people with religious values um, such as love and compassion and justice and courage and hope um, and, and to be uh, helping them understand how these issues, these intersected issues that I named around um, racial justice, environmental justice, and health justice are actually um, voting issues and they need to be paying attention to them as they cast their votes uh, in November at all levels. And um, those levers to me are, are one of the ways that we can really work for change in this country. And I think that Religious people have a unique opportunity and a unique voice in this conversation because we are coming at these issues from a moral standpoint and not just um, understanding them as a way to sort of um, continue to center ourselves in the conversation, but in order to actually center others in the conversation. So we work on behalf and in solidarity of others who are struggling in these crises. At Interfaith Power and Light, our approach is to work three primary levers for change. The first is around personal action. And so we very practically teach people of faith how to lower their energy use in their homes and their places of worship as an act of faith. The second lever is around policy advocacy. So in order to advance the work that we need to advance, we need to have the right policies in place at the local, the state, and the federal levels. And the third lever that we are working is voter mobilization. And so helping people understand how caring for the climate caring for the earth and caring for creation are a moral imperative and that they need to turn out to vote with climate in mind. When I came to the issue of climate change, um, it was really through the issue of hunger. Um, at the time I was serving local congregations in the state of Iowa and the congregations that I was serving were working on um, many types of hunger ministries, whether that was um, gathering food for the food pantry or uh, gathering funds for global hunger issues. Um, but we were also doing advocacy work around um, a living wage so that families could lift themselves out of poverty and become more self-sufficient. And climate change was an issue to me that was, uh, I, I was sort of off to the side. I knew that it existed. And I thought, you know, I was doing my recycling and composting in my garden and um, I had changed my light bulbs. And so I really thought I was doing what I needed to do on the issue of climate change. 
And it wasn't until I read an article on the geopolitics of food that connected the dots for me between the issue of hunger and the issue of climate change that I recognized that if I truly wanted to solve global hunger, I really needed to be working on climate change. And I think for me, the lesson in that is that congregations are working on all kinds of issues and have been for as long as we can remember, whether it's hunger or immigration or disaster relief or global conflict, um, issues of racial justice in this country. Um, we uh, often don't see the connection between our issue and the issue of climate change. Um, but these issues are very intersected and our approaches to the solutions for them need to be intersected as well. And my main takeaway personally in that time was looking at the fact that I have two sons and I really was compelled to be able to look them in the eyes and tell them that I had done everything that I could to work for solutions knowing that they and their generation would be even more impacted by climate change than my own. And so that has been a lesson for me and a way to connect with congregations um, in a way that, that values the work that they're already doing um, on these other issues and also um, helping them to understand the intersection with the issue of climate and how we can work on both of those issues together. The one thing that I want you to do right now is to go to our website at interfaithpowerandlight.org and I want you to register and pledge to become a faith climate justice voter.